Well, this morning uh, we are continuing in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, as I said before, is filled with interesting things. Uh, I, I read something recently that may, may be true. We do, uh, well, when we began this study, we saw that John wrote this Gospel in order to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And, of course, by proving that, that there may be those who would embrace him as the Messiah and be saved. Uh, some other writer suggested that perhaps John wrote what he did to fill in the gaps of what the other writers have written. Uh, and that may be true as well because we do find several things in the Gospel of John that we don't find in some of the other Gospels. And I think we would also should note the human element here, as, as, um, as it is, or as, as you well, can't think of the words I'm looking for. But anyway, the human element. There is a human author, right? And it's reflected in the way he writes. I don't know if you've noticed this. The Gospel of John is written in very simple language. As a matter of fact, if you were taking a Greek class and you were uh, going to begin translating the Scriptures, they have you start in the writings of John because they're so simple. And yet, the way he writes is so complex in certain places that it's hard to understand what, what he's actually saying because of the style. So because of that, sometimes, again, we see a different perspective. And that's what we're going to be seeing this morning as we consider the Father and the Sons working together to work out our salvation. So what I'd like to do is read for you John chapter 5, backing up just a bit into verse 17 and uh, reading through verse 24. Uh, this is what we read. And again, um, uh, well, to get a little bit of the context, they were, uh, Jesus had just healed the man by the pool of Bethesda. And he told him to pick up his pallet, his bed, basically his cot, and to walk with it. But it was the Sabbath day. And when they found out that um, it was uh, Jesus who told the man to do this, they began persecuting Jesus for this, which is what we saw last time. But we pick it up in verse 17. But he, that is Jesus, answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone. But he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, <clears throat> just going to back up for a moment and, and talk about what we saw last time. Last time we saw Jesus go up to a feast at Jerusalem and we saw that that feast was likely the Passover. The feast that God instituted during the Exodus when he brought judgment on the firstborn of the Egyptians but spared the firstborn of his own people if they would only believe his promise sacrifice a lamb and put its blood on the doorposts and the lintels of the house. The angel of death would then pass over. As you know, that blood was a picture of Jesus. Now it's interesting, uh, this is interesting because of where Jesus first went when he actually entered into Jerusalem for the feast. He didn't go to the affluent areas. Again, those are usually the areas that are the hardest, where the rich and the powerful lived. But he went to the hospital he went to the Pool of Bethesda. Now it's interesting because of where the pool was located. 
Remember John tells us it was next to the sheep gate. That's where the lambs were brought into the city to be sold for sacrifice. And you better believe there were a lot of lambs being sacrificed around this time of the year because of the feast of Passover. Now the Lamb of God who was to be slain to heal our sicknesses entered through the gate through which the sheep would be brought for sacrifice in order to heal a man who had been sick for 38 years. This man had been looking for God's mercy in that pool that the angel stirred at different times, at different seasons, but he found it instead in that ocean of God's mercy which God has provided in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's, um, let's begin to well, orient ourselves towards what we're looking at this morning. Remember, Jesus had told the man not only to get up, uh, which of course he couldn't have done apart from the grace that the Lord also imparted to him, that healing virtue, but he also told him to pick up his pallet and walk on the Sabbath. When the Jews found out that Jesus was the one who actually told him to do this, they immediately began to persecute him. Now, Jesus' response is very interesting because here he vindicates himself, not only by claiming to be equal with the Father, but by doing the very thing that his Father wanted him to do. In other words, the Father, God, wanted this man to carry this pallet on the Sabbath. Now this morning what I'd like us to do is consider two things from this text. And the first is that Jesus only did what he saw his father doing. In other words, Jesus only did his father's will. Which means, secondly, sometimes something that we sometimes forget. That the father is just as much behind your salvation as Jesus is. Because the father is the one who was working it out through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, we're going to see many other things, but these are the two main things. Now first of all, let's consider that Jesus only did what he saw his father doing, which again, I said, is a strange way of putting it, but we need to understand what John means by this. When the Jews persecuted Jesus for healing the man and for telling the man to carry his pallet on the Sabbath, he answered in verse 17, my father is working until now and I myself am working. I mentioned last time that one thing Jesus meant by this statement was that his work didn't stop on the Sabbath. He didn't take a day off from what his father called him to do. He was a full-time Messiah, we might say a full-time Christ. And of course, we need to be full-time Christians as well. But the reason why Jesus was doing this on the Sabbath was because he was doing the kind of work that was allowed on the Sabbath. Really the kind of work that we should be seeking to do all the time. I mean, what did Jesus actually do but show mercy to a man who had been sick for 38 years? Why did he tell him to, to take up his pallet and walk on the Sabbath except to draw attention to the fact that God had had mercy on that man? You know, usually Jesus isn't trying to draw attention to himself, but in this case, he is. It seemed like he particularly did this on the Sabbath. He had a reason behind it. Now, on the Sabbath, as you know from the, um, all the various devotionals we've been looking at that Greg has been writing, we are to take a break from our work, the work that we do on the other six days, and from anything that draws our minds and our hearts away from the Lord so that we can rest and spend that time with the Lord, with the one whom we love more than any other. But we also know there's two different kinds of work, two kinds of work that we're never to take a break from. The kind that is necessary to preserve our lives and the kind that is necessary to preserve the lives of others. Now we call these two works, works of necessity, things we have to do to preserve our lives, and works of mercy, things we do to preserve other people's lives. Jesus merely showed this man mercy. He was preserving his life. He didn't break the Sabbath. And so they really didn't have any grounds to accuse him, although in this case they weren't accusing him for healing him, but telling him to carry his pallet, which he did to draw attention to that act of mercy. Now, when Jesus said this, we have to recognize they found something even more objectionable. He was claiming to be equal with God. Now, how did they arrive at that conclusion? Well, it's because Jesus 
in his statement, claimed that God was his father. I mean, look at verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Did Jesus ever claim to be equal with God? Yes. Now, we know in Scripture that there are two senses in which one might be called a child of God. Okay, the one is by adoption, and the second is by nature. Now, if you've turned from your sins and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a child of God, and God is also your Father, but, of course, it's by way of adoption. Paul writes in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you are his child by adoption. You know, the same was true of the Jews in the Old Covenant. They were God's children also by adoption. In Romans 9, verses 3 through 5, when Paul is lamenting the fact that the Jews have not received their Messiah, this is what he writes. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who were Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons. And the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers? And from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all? God blessed forever. Now Paul could mean one of two things by this. He could mean that that they were the ones God intended to send his son into the world to say that he might adopt them to himself or to himself, but I do think that what he really means here is that God had already adopted them as he adopted all the children of Abraham. We do recognize a difference between these two kinds of adoptions. In the Old Covenant, the grounds of the adoption of the children of Israel was the fact that they were the natural children of Abraham. They were his offspring, his seed. And we also know by reading the Old Testament that most of them were not converted. Most of them were unregenerate. In the New Covenant, the grounds of our adoption is not that we are the physical offspring of Abraham, but that we are his spiritual children, that we have repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, even as Abraham believed, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, if you have done this, you are Abraham's spiritual children. You are the children of God by adoption. But I told you there's another sense in which one might be called a child of God, and that is by nature, and that's what Jesus is. I think we recognize through the creation that every creature that God made that procreates, and again, there's only one creature I can think of he's made that doesn't, and that's the angels. But every creature that he has made that procreates has offspring that share the same nature as those creatures. In other words, dogs have litters of dogs. Cats have litters of cats. Rabbits have litters of rabbits, right? And when we have children, we have human beings for our offspring. They share our nature. They are a part of the human race. Well, the same thing is true of the Son of God. He is the child of God, the Son of God. He shares the same nature as God because he is eternally begotten of God. And sharing that nature as God means that he is equal with God. Now, is that right or is that wrong that we understand it this way? Well, notice the Jews understood perfectly what Jesus was saying, which is why they thought he was blaspheming and why they wanted to kill him because he was claiming to be equal with God. Now, how did Jesus respond to this? Well, uh, he not only did not deny what they were saying, no, you're, you're wrong, that's not what I'm claiming, but he used it to prove that he had the authority to do what he had just done with regard to telling this man 
to pick up his pallet and walk on the Sabbath. We read in verse 19. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does in like manner. Which means, of course, that what he had just done was the Father's will. Now, I do want to notice again that John is using really strange language here. It almost sounds like the Father is kind of going before Jesus and Jesus sees him do something. And then he'll do something. But I don't think Jesus means by this that when he sees the Father go and heal somebody, then Jesus goes over and heals that person, or maybe he heals another person because he sees the Father doing exactly that same thing. I think what he means is that what the Father does and what he does is the same, that the Father was working through him, that he was doing what the Father planned. What is it that he saw the Father doing? Well, basically, he saw the Father's plan and he was doing that. That is his submission to the Father's will. He means the same thing, I believe, as what we saw in our meditation this morning in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 19, as far as his working through his Son. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He reconciled us through Christ. God was working through Christ, in Christ, to do this. Now again, let me just remind you, when the Son of God took our nature, he also took upon himself our limitations, which means as a man, he didn't have infinite power, he didn't have infinite knowledge. He was actually completely dependent upon his Father for power through the Holy Spirit and guidance for his work on earth. And so as the Father revealed his will to Jesus and as he gave him the power to do the things that he was showing him by his Holy Spirit, Jesus submitted to it and he did it. He saw that this is what the Father wanted and so he did it. He was committed to doing his Father's will. Now, as I've said, this means, among other things, that his healing the man who had been sick for 38 years and telling him to pick up your pallet and walk on the Sabbath, that was the Father's will. Jesus did this because this is what he saw his Father wanted to be done. He wanted the man to carry the pallet so it would draw attention to the mercy that God had shown him having been sick for 38 years, was now made entirely well through the power of His Son, Jesus Christ. The Father is working through His Son. The Son was seeing the Father's will and doing it, and that is why the man was walking. But again, this means secondly, and this is our second point, that the Father is just as much behind your salvation as Jesus is. He's working behind it. He's the one who planned it. He's the one who's working through Jesus to bring it about. But I do want you to notice under this point that he was working and is working in such a way as to draw attention to his son, that his son might receive an equal amount of glory. Now let's not forget what the father was actually doing through Jesus. I mean, he wasn't just doing random acts of healing. He was working out the plan of salvation. He was doing what was necessary in order to save you and me from our sins. He was doing what was necessary, in other words, to raise the dead. I told you that uh, John talks about things a little bit differently. Uh, Jesus goes on to tell us that this is one of the things the Son sees the Father doing. And what this means is raising people from spiritual death to life, at least that's one of the things it means. Well, let's, let's read verses 20 and 21. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. 
Now here Jesus first emphasizes the relationship he has with his father. His father loves him. He loves him because he shares his nature. He is his son. Remember, you know, he, he shares, when God has a son, that son shares the same nature as he has. We read in Scripture that Jesus shares his image. He is the exact representation of his nature. And out of that love that the Father has for the Son, he shows Jesus everything he is doing, everything he has planned. And what has he planned? Well, everything that we've seen unfold in the history of the human race and particularly in the life of Jesus and in his work of redemption, that is what the Father has planned. We see it in what Jesus is doing. But he goes on to say the Father has greater works to show him that Jesus might do these greater works so that we might be amazed. And the first thing is his raising the dead. Now, is, is Jesus here speaking about raising those who are physically dead or spiritually dead? I think in first blush it almost looks like physical, but I really think it's talking about both. He raises those who are spiritually dead to a new kind of life. He's actually, next week we're going to look at the two resurrections. And one of them is spiritual and the other one is physical. But he'll go on in these verses to tell us the time had already come for those who were dead to hear his voice and that those who heard would live. What he means is that now was the time of salvation. Now he was speaking with a voice that raises the dead. As a matter of fact, if you're a believer here this morning, you know what Jesus is talking about here because you've experienced it. He's talking about the new birth. He's talking about regeneration. He's talking about moving from death to life, having your eyes opened and your heart changed. We don't often think about the new birth in these terms, but we need to realize that, that it is a miracle. And I realize some people make a distinction between conversion and the kind of miracles Jesus was doing, but the new birth is a miracle. It is a resurrection to a new life. It's something the Bible tells us that nature, the way we come into this world, that that can't produce this. It's something that only God can do. But it is also, because it's something only God can do, it is evidence. It is evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, that he alone can save us, that he alone can change the heart and turn a sinner into a saint. It's perhaps the greatest miracle that Jesus came to do and perhaps the main one that he does today. And by the way, let me just point out as far as its evidential power, Jesus did say, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And that love comes from this miracle. It comes from the spiritual resurrection. When God gives you his Holy Spirit and makes you come alive with love towards him and love towards your neighbor. So first of all, this is talking about spiritual resurrection. Just as the Father gives life, brings life from the dead, so he has given to the Son the ability to do this. But, as we're going to also see in the next several verses, Jesus is also talking about physical resurrection here that he will eventually raise those who are physically dead, that he will raise them, as a matter of fact, to judgment. The Bible says a day is coming when Jesus is going to return. And when he returns, he is going to empty out the graves. He is going to speak, and they're all going to come out of the tombs. And by the way, when he speaks, the living are also going to be gathered together to one place for the final judgment. Now, Jesus tells us here that on that day, he will have the honor of being the judge, that that is an honor his Father has given to him. Verses 22 and 23. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now basically this, this uh, right to judge is part of the authority that the Father has given to his Son in his role as the mediator. Uh, he, is in, he has given him, well, as we read in the commission uh, that he gives to his church, Jesus prefaces what he says to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given to me 
in heaven and on earth. Basically, the rule of the nations and the right to judge. That has been entrusted to Jesus, our mediator, right now. That's what it means that he's ruling and reigning over the earth currently. And it was given to him, as Jesus tells us in verse 22, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now this evening, we're going to read Psalm 2 for our call to worship. And we're going to see in that psalm that the Father is going to say to the nations, after he installs his king on Mount Zion, which is talking about the installation of Jesus Christ as ruler over creation in his mediatorial office, same thing he said to his disciples just before the Great Commission. This is what the Father says to the nations in Psalm 2, verses 11 and 12. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, the Father has given to the Son authority, and authority demands honor. When you know that your very life and your future well-being is in the hands of the Son, it makes you respect Him. It makes you honor Him. And you know what? The Bible says that the Father is going to cause every single human being that has ever lived to give honor to the Son. One day, every knee shall bow before him. By the way, this is the topic of this evening's sermon, so I don't want to get too far ahead. But the Father has determined that every single human being that has ever lived is going to honor the Son in one way or another. And the Bible says there's really two ways that you can honor the Son. You can bow the knee to him right now. You can turn from your sins. You can trust in Him. And by His grace, you can pass from death to life. You can experience this spiritual resurrection from judgment to full forgiveness. And, and again, most of you here know what that means. That's one way you can bow the knee willingly to Him. Receive Him as your Lord and Savior. And what a tremendous blessing it is to be able to do that and to know now that everything that comes into your life is going to work together for good and you have nothing to fear because he has blotted out your sins and has given his perfect righteousness to you so that you don't have to fear the day of judgment. But there's another way that you can also bow the knee to Jesus, and that is if you continue to refuse to submit to him, one day you are going to be raised from the dead in the future and on that day be condemned along with the rest of the world for your sins because you wouldn't repent, because you wouldn't trust in the Savior, the only Savior that the Father offers to the world. And the question I'd like to end on this morning is basically this, which way are you going to choose? If you haven't already made that decision, which, which way are you going to go? Well, I hope if you haven't already bowed the knee to Christ that you will choose to bow the knee to Him now. Jesus promises that He will save you if you will only do this. He says in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. So have you heard him this morning? You know, Jesus doesn't speak from heaven anymore, but he does speak through his word. And he does speak through the preaching of his word. He's speaking to you now. Have you heard him speaking to you this morning? Have you believed the one who sent him, who tells you that Jesus is the only way of salvation? You need to if you want to be saved. The Lord is speaking to you this morning. So do not turn a deaf ear. Don't harden your heart. Scripture says today if you hear his voice, turn away from your sins and trust in him to save you. The Lord will do that. There is a very encouraging verse that says, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. If you want to come to Jesus, there's nothing that's going to stop you. And you don't have to be afraid that he won't receive you. He will. All you have to do is come to him, trust him, be willing to turn from your sins 
and He will forgive you. I hope and pray by His grace that you will do that if you haven't. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord again to apply His word to, uh, to us as we need to hear it.